it's about half, about a dozen slides, so I will just fire through it, um, so if we get to any questions at the end. Just before we get started, I'd just like to point out, first of all, I'm not a surveyor. I have no surveying experience whatsoever. I bought the uh, Cave Surveying BCRA book for £3 in Inglesport. That is about my knowledge of surveying, so I'm not going to claim to be any sort of an expert or having done any sort of wondrous surveys anywhere at all. Also, it's not my project. I have uh, borrowed the idea from a lad called Joe uh, in America. I think he's over, over at MIT. He's put it together. He's called it the Cavertron because it sounds like a very American thing to call it. It has got its own website. So if you've got any sort of further interest or even any interest in building one yourself, you can. If you go to cavertron.com, it's the website. Everything's hosted on there. He's done all sorts of surveys of caves over in Texas. Um, and also he's put together quite a comprehensive sort of build guide if anyone's interested in making their own. So what is it? How does it work? LIDAR, just to put it in rough sort of simplest terms, because obviously not, I'm aware that not everyone is going to be aware of what it is, how it works. What it does is there's this little rotating box at the top on the right hand side of your screen just there. The top of that box will rotate round and as it rotates round it fires off a laser that laser will hit a solid object, the brick in the example I've picked, that will then reflect off of that solid object and go back in. The way it works is it measures the amount of time it takes for that laser beam to leave the LIDAR, hit the solid object and go back in. The amount of time it takes, it calculates the distance from it. So it will work out the distance from where the LIDAR is to that solid wall. It will then rotate round, so half a degree or so, and it will then fire off another laser and it will just go around in that 360 degree circle. Around at 360 degree, degrees, 10 times every second. And it calculates it's 40,000, sorry, it's not, 8,000 measurements per second. So what this guy's actually put together or what I've built that he's, uh, he's designed it's a combined surveying tool with a lay with a lidar attached to it. As you survey a cave, you go through as you normally would, either with sort of a disto or with a paper setup. You, you capture your survey stations, all your measurements as you normally would, and then as you progress down the passage or you traverse from one station to another, the device has that little lidar scanner at the front that will rotate around, and as it rotates around, it will capture your up, down, left, right measurements as you do so. So as I've just said, the way it works, point it towards the target. Target is, it's a reflective board, if you like, it's a small board. You point it towards that, that filters the measurement. So it will only pick up the distance between your, yourself taking the survey and that board. It will display in front of you. There's a screenshot I've done of just somewhere in the kitchen, I think off the top of my head. It will do your distance for you. It will do your compass angle or azimuth. Your inclination, so yeah, sort of angle off the horizontal. You roll, so if you've pointed the, the device to sort of one side or the other, and the temperature as well. And then that will all be saved as you go through it, uh, and that's how it works out your line plot. So it's exactly the same as if you're doing a paper-based survey with a Sumto com compass and an inclino inclinometer, or even a disto setup. It just saves it all as you go along. It will recognize where you are so from you once you've done your shot you will take your next survey you will take your shot towards your next survey station you can do it as a foresight or a backsight it will either work out as a pattern so if you start off with station one to station two it will guess you're going from station two to three or it gives the option of putting a, a different station in if you're going off down a, a different leg you can also do backsights as well just to sort of try and improve your improve your accuracy as you go through the cave with your line plot, you can view it on the screen as you go through, and you can obviously you can change it from a plan view to, a, to an elevation view. You can also view your stations. That's the screenshot I've put on the right-hand side there. So if you've got any stations that you think are, are wrong or they're off, you can delete them, you can take them again, you can edit them if you think you've made a, made a very simple mistake. So as you go through the cave, you've got that information there in front of you. So if there's anything you think is massively off, you can just have a quick check He's as you go through. Here. That is pretty much the same as the Disto system that is sort of commonly in use in use at the moment. Uh, 
Now the difference between this one, sorry, between the Cavatron and the normal DISO system is as you go through walking towards your station, that LiDAR scanner at the front rotates around that 360 degrees and that's capturing your, well, the equivalent of the up, down, left, right. It's just doing it 360 degrees as it spins around. So as you walk, crawl or whatever there else there is, a sort of flat out, <laughs> go towards your survey station. You point it towards that target. As you go through, it picks up a point cloud. So on the right hand side of the screen, there should be a view. That is what it picks up as it goes along. So you're walking right through the middle of there and it's picking up the walls to the left, to the above, to the right and underneath you as well. As you move a little bit closer, it will do the same thing again and again and again. And what you eventually end up is you end up with a series of these, these sort of snapshots, if you like, on the, the vertical plane and they build up the passage like on the right hand side. What you end up with is as you traverse down the passage. So if you look, you should still be able to see my screen. And on the left hand side there, we've got the beginning of this traverse. So we've started at, let's call it station one. We've walked through the cave, through here, right through the middle, and you've ended up at station two. From there, you can see it's split into a series of, of lines, if you like, so that each one of those is it rotating around 360 degrees, and it produces that, that sort of set cross section, if you like. You can rotate it round, you've got it in a plan view. Once you reach the end of there, you then turn around and you take a shot at your next station, so call it station three. Once you've got that station, you can then walk towards it, and as you walk towards it, you get your next segment, and that is essentially sort of how it, how it builds up. So then you end up with two. As you work through the cave, you'll end up with another one, and another one, and another one, and that is how you end up with your sort of LiDAR survey, if you like. And it ends up like there and you can obviously you can move it around the screen once you plug it into a computer and you, you copy all the data across. So how quick is it or how, how quick can you do it and how accurate is it? So recording a station is literally a case of you point your base unit or your, your LiDAR scanner towards one of those orange cards, push a button, it takes less than a second to record that data. It records, it does an average of 900 readings, sort of for your compass measurement and for your, your inclination, it works at an average between them. It's a, accurate to about sort of two degrees or so, that sort of worst case scenario. The maximum distance it will record is 40 meters. That's just the limitation of the laser sort of tape measure or laser distance meter that you use to record between your stations. And the maximum radius it will do is it will record 12 meters. So the actual LiDAR would do a maximum of a 25 meter diameter passage. You can overlay them. So if you have an extremely wide passage, for example, you could do one traverse down the left hand side, you could do a traverse down the right hand side and it would then put them together, it would merge them and it would cover your whole passage for you. As I mentioned before, it does 8,000 data points a second. So as you're walking, crawling or going flat out along this passage, it will just build them up one after the other uh, as, you, as you go through. Battery life on it, it lasts for just over seven hours and it weighs about a kilogram. Allegedly it's waterproof, but I wouldn't sort of really particularly want to be testing it, but I've been told that it, it will sort of hold its own if, a, if it does get wet. What does it look like? So this is the, the first version. I've moved on a little bit. I've got the uh, a second version now. This is the first one. Essentially, it's exactly the same thing. You have a box that contains all the gubbins, uh, that's in the next slide with a touch screen to the front so you can view what you're doing as you go through. You've got that detachable LiDAR scanner at the top. So as you'll notice, it's sort of, it's at right angles or perpendicular to the, to the main unit. And that's where you can capture that sort of vertical plane as you're walking along. Inside the bottom of that main unit, so you've got a LiDAR scanner at the top and inside the bottom unit, there's a battery pack in there, there's a touch screen and you've got a little lane laser range finder to the front and that's how it works out the distance between between your stations part of the setup you have to do is you have to calibrate it to take into a fact obviously it's an electronic compass that it uses and that's affected by the sort of other electrical components and the battery and everything else so part of the calibration is you, as you go through it through the steps for it is you, you measure how much that compass is affected just so it can take away that deflection that it that it puts on it 
measurements are all recorded on a SD card inside the camera. That will record literally hundreds of caves. Um, you will never run out of memory from it. And once you're ready to sort of dock it into a computer and process your files, it's got a USB port, so literally you plug it straight into your computer and off you go. So the output, what comes out the other end, you get two files from each survey you do. So you get a survey file, that's actually for the Walls software because it's, it's American, it's the Texas lot who have put it together. And that's the screenshot on the left hand side. That's very similar to what you'll get in any sort of computerized survey software or method that you use. It records your stations, your, your inclination, your azimuth, your distance, and obviously the time you've taken that measurement. From that, you can put that into any sort of cave survey software. So anything like Cervex or Theron or anything like that, it's all a very similar format. You may need to sort of alter the, the way it's formatted, but it will, it will accept it. And on the right hand side, you get a data, sort of a, a huge data file, and that's your point cloud. Each line on there is one dot. Um, as it goes through, it will record these dots. And then when you plug it into a piece of software, sort of cloud-based software, it will take those dots and it will plot them on the screen. Um, you can use them, so if you just wanted to do a survey, you could use the device just to do a normal survey as you would with just recording your stations. And the point cloud is just an extra, an extra bonus if you like. So what comes out the other end? So to start off with, you get your raw data. That's on the left-hand side. You can't make it out that well because it's quite zoomed out, but that is made up of a series of dots. So every single white mark on that screen is where it's fired off a laser on, as it's rotated around and it's picked up a solid wall and it's reflected back and it's worked out its distance. There is, I think, 16 different traverses in that little survey and it's just the entrance series. So the first 50 meters or so of Great Duke Cave, you just took out for a bit of a trial run the day before lockdown came and knocked us all on the head. Unfortunately, I didn't get any further than that. Uh, I had to go in for my tea um, and it was just a trial run just to work it out, see if I could use the system and how, how well it was to process the data at the other end. So, so the next step along, it's on the right hand you see side of your screen and that's basically it's the mesh. So what I've done is I've applied an algorithm to all those little tiny dots and it's tried to work out for itself what, what's a solid surface and what's not. So it's trying to connect those dots together. Um, there are a couple of bits where it's slightly off. Um, there's a very strange looking thing about sort of halfway across uh, on the right hand, halfway up the screen on the right. And it's just trying to guess where the cave is. It's trying to link those dots together and that's what it's come up with. So it's not 100%, but from a visualization point of view and trying to you know, visualize that cave and move it around, it works out fairly well. And what I've done just at the end there, just to finish off, is a bit of a sort of an animation if you like. So it's a bit of a fly through of just what, of what the software can do. So all it is is that mesh cloud and you just rotate it around. It just gives you a better sort of That is pretty much it, I think. I'm assuming that my uh, my sound worked the whole way through uh, and everyone was able to hear me. Yep, it's good that day. Uh, apologies to those on a phone. <laughs> I appreciate it probably wasn't the easiest, the easiest for everyone to sort of listen to. Uh, I did try and keep it as untechnical as I could without sort of going into too much technicalities about it. Question, Dave, obvious one for me is roughly how much does it cost to build one of those? About, shut the door shut, probably about £250. Oh, not, not as bad as I thought, is it? And the trouble is, you, your commercial alternatives is you're looking at sort of ten grand upwards. Mm, yeah, um, they're not they're not cheap at all. And that's sort of the stage. The stage where I am now is now I've got it. I've taken it out for its little test run. I can see that it works, or certainly it works to the the standard that I'm happy with. Is how I can sort of process that data, or how I can get it out there, because it's all well and good me displaying it on the screen and making it spin around. I'm trying to look at how I can sort of publish that on the internet so for other people who will be able to get hold of it, then they can move it around the screen, have a look at certain elements if they, if they so wish. Dave, um, yeah, Dave, Dave wants to 
have a question? Yeah, um, when, yep. you, when you're moving along a passage with it, um, have you got to mm -hmm. keep it pointing at your next station so it knows sort of where it is, or is it working that out from its angle and its orientation and so on? So it's a combination of both. It's mm. every five seconds it needs to see that station. Right. Um, if you have a slight trip or if you point it away and it can't read the station, it'll give you a little beep and it will, it will say, you have a little message on the screen saying align it towards the station. But if you don't, it will look at where it just was. It's got your direction. It's got your inclination. So it knows what sort of direction you're going in and mm. it will guess if you like. Right. Uh, so just for that couple of gaps. seconds yeah. and then it will tie it back in when you start pointing towards that station again. So, so, so ideally you want someone ahead of you all the time holding up that card for the reflection for the yeah, well, it would be at a, at a, it would be yeah, it would be at a static point at that station. So whether it's be you've got someone there holding it, or you've stuck it Pick to the wall, certain, or it's yeah. on a tripod, whatever it is. But yeah, you're always pointing it towards that towards that station. Then I've got another question as well. The yeah. the window for the laser beam to come out through, it's mm -hmm. you've made it as a square box there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does the do the corners of that affect it at all, or not really? A tiny bit. You yeah. can see a couple of points where it, got, it, it gets caught out. Part of the processing software when you plug it into your computer is you can filter that out. So you right. set the, the degrees, if you like, you want to cancel out. So if it's in the corner, it will yeah, be, okay. yeah. say, 43 to 46 degrees. You can just cut those points out and it will just get the straight so bits. The gaps in yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Another question, Dave. Did I read that it was a 12 metre uh, range? So I presume deep shafts to be a problem. It's just the lidar part of it is is twelve yeah. meters. Um, so if you're if you if you're in a shaft, if it's less than sort of twenty five meters, you're okay if you're going down the middle. But what you can do is you can do more than one traverse or more than one walk to a station. So if you're walking to, once you've got that station, you can walk down the left hand side of a passage and do one. You oh, can yeah. walk down the right hand side of a passage and do one, and then it will merge them together and it will cover whatever sort of size passage you want. Obviously, height is an issue if it's more than so 12 metres high. It's going to be getting up there to, to use yeah, it. Yeah, so Avon, an unexplored Avon, you'd have a problem, wouldn't you? Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. But, the, but at that point, though, it, it's all about money. Um, mm. You can buy the little LiDAR sensors that will cover up to 25 metres. They're about £600. The one I've got that does 12 metres was £65. So it's a it's, it's a case of money more than than it's sort of capability. Jump. Yeah, mm. but but not so much of a gain as well if you go up that big jump, really. Yeah. Mm. Mm. If um there's water falling, presumably that confuses it. It does, yes. Um, if you have water falling over it, it will obviously it will affect the way that that laser beam sort of fired out, if you like. I was meaning more not actually landing on it. Obviously, that was. Oh, sort of a waterfall type thing. Waterfall or, say, drip, or say um, a shower coming, drops coming in the passage. Will it, will it sort of get that muddled as a, as a... It probably a would do. I'm not going to lie to you. I haven't, I haven't tried it. The other one I thought about is if you come across sort of a wall of stalactites, so somewhere like... Um, I completely forgot the name of it. Wherever it was, <laughs> went to went to East Gill a couple of months ago uh, and mm. it's very well decorated. Anywhere like that, it's going to struggle because it's going to hit that wall of stalactites. If you've got a, a wall of stalactites and it's not going to be able to penetrate through, you may get the odd sort of beam that goes through if you like, but it will it will cause some confusion. It was on my list of tests to take it almost mm. to see how it would react to that. So the colonnades, somewhere like that. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's very good. impressive. It's very good. Mm. Yeah. Impressive. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I say it's just unfortunate that the timing of things is that mm. I literally I took it out for that first test run um, and then the day after we all went straight into lockdown and that was that was the end of that. Have you spoken to any of the um, like the surveys within Craven like say Patrick or somebody like that to see what their, their slant is of it? No not yet it's still okay. still a bit sort of early days it's mm -hmm. just so yeah. happened that the uh, the BCRA yeah, okay. have, uh, have found out about it about the time that I finished about it. So there's been a bit of a, a conversation thread going on the UK caving forum about it. I had a couple of PCBs that I got hold of for building mine, um, which I've then sold on to them. So there are three more devices being built. They're all in uh, 
Grampian or GSG, as I think it's called, Glenn, from our, uh, our last <laughs> quiz. <laughs> so yeah. there are three more being assembled sort of in the country as we speak. They're putting them together. Um, but otherwise in the UK, there's none that I'm aware of. Have you got any idea what would happen if you were, say, abseiling down a shaft and pointing it down a shaft as you went? Would it cope with that, do you think? You have to have that survey station. So that orange disc that I waved about on the uh, screen, yeah. it's got a reflective tape on it. Mm. And there's a filter that is on the distance meter. So it will only pick up a reflection from that station. So right. you'd have to have someone at the bottom mm. holding that yeah. station or, or sort of just left static mm. as you go towards it for it to measure it. You wouldn't be yeah. able to sort of just lower it down and point no, it towards no, the ground. Right. Yeah. Would it also, put, would it, if you had that situation and you did have a station at the bottom, would it cope with the fact that you're going down vertically and with possibly a bit of rotation on it? Yes, it would. Um, so yeah. it's got that inclination, that inclination, it does, it, it does a full 360 yeah. degrees. Okay. So if I point yeah. it at the ground, it knows it's sort of mm. 90 degrees pointing straight downwards. Yeah. Um, and also it's got the roll measurement as well, so it'll realise that it's rotating round. Mm. If, Presumably, um, you've got you've got lots of surveys of your house now on the inside. I have plenty of the house, the cat on the sofa, the sofa <laughs> without the cat, the ornaments in the window. Yes, mm. <laughs> if it works right on soft surfaces. Then it'll pick that up as well. On what? Sorry, on soft surfaces. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, 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 covered the sofa and everything else. <laughs> if you're going down a shaft. When there's a rope hanging down the shaft, does that cause problems or not? It will do because it will pick up that rope as you mm. uh, as you go down. Uh, you do have the option of taking these data points out. So if you get something silly like I don't know, I scanned my welly at some point because my foot went in front of the scanner, you can then delete those out if it's obvious to you mm. that it shouldn't be there. So it's pretty much the same as the you know the corners of the box where it's trying to keep it waterproof. If you can mm. see them and you know they're there, you can then delete them out. Mm. Mm. Very impressive. Mm. It is. Mm. So, and is it going sorry. to be scar top next? <laughs> oh, that's a different one. You talked me into that as well. In fact, I do believe, Paul, that you've talked me into absolutely everything I've had to do. I believe <laughs> the front cover of, of, of the, the journal was it was your idea. I believe this was your idea, and as was uh, doing a, a short story about off at, off at scar top. <laughs> 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 it's his medical bedside manner that does it. <laughs> <laughs> was it was it very difficult to build it in the end? Um, I didn't think so. I haven't touched a soldering iron since I was at school, aged fifteen, mm -hmm. and I had no no difficult no difficulty with it. I think you have to be fairly technically minded. So I mean, to me, it's it seems fairly straightforward. Mm. Um, so I had no trouble, but I think I had a bit of whatever the word is, interesting technology, shall we say. Mm. Mm. I mean, I was sort of planning on waiting until I can get back out there and get a proper survey together before I broadcast it to the world, if you, if you like. But unfortunately, circumstances have sort of dictated a different, a different story. Mm. I think the survey you've done anyway, the one you've just shown us, is very impressive, really, as a result, considering, you know, the a relatively low spend on it. So, yeah. Uh, for me, it's the fact, if, anything, if nothing else, apart from the cost, I'll never be able to afford a proper one, mm. is it's so portable. So it is literally, it's the size of a, a lunchbox, say. Mm. Uh, it weighs a kilogram. You can put it in a peli case and lug it into a cave with you. It's not one of the great big industrial ones where it has to go in its own special survey tripod and it mm. weighs... Carry it for you, Dave. I'm good with peli cases. <laughs> well, you, you, you know what they're capable of. <laughs> yeah, somebody has got a roll of gaffer tape. <laughs> <laughs> and Dave can mend it for you <laughs> when I <laughs> drop it. <laughs> we make a team, then. <laughs> oh. Well, yeah, if you can be bodged on men with gaffer tape, then I'm your man. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Dave, thank you very much for that. That was yeah. really interesting. Thank actually. you, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. So I do get now, once I do get out and about and again, I do get to take it for a proper run. Um, I will put something together mm. and either send it in for the journal or put it on the, the email list just to show them what it what it can do. And also, apparently, my little demo scan that I uh, put out there is going to be in the next descent, uh, the BCR.